Hi, everyone. I'm Will, and I am a co-host of this new web show slash Google Hangout thing that uh, we're trying as an experiment. My co-host is uh, Steve Wolfman, and we have a special guest, Kim Vole. The idea is we're going to have a guest each week who is involved in computer science education, and we'll get a chance to, to learn about their perspective on teaching and what sort of techniques they use or what activities they have and so forth. And it's a, it's a chance to get us all to, to expand our, our view of teaching and our techniques of teaching and, and just try to improve ourselves. Um, so this is our first, first Hangout. And we've got a great group of folks who've uh, joined us as sort of our peanut gallery. And hopefully they will have uh, questions uh, to ask as, as we go through this. Uh, probably the way we'll do it, I mean, we don't really know, so this is our first time. Uh, but the way I was thinking is that maybe in the beginning, uh, we can ask some long form questions for Kim, and Kim can, can give long form answers. And then as we go on, then we can maybe get a little more interactive. But I want to make sure that Kim has a chance to give uh, give some long answers without interruption, and then we can maybe start uh, with some back and forth. And uh, I think the idea is that we're planning to go for for something like an hour. Um, and what else? I think that's about it. Uh, we'll we'll see how things go, and we might have to adjust things for the next show. But I I think it'll be great. Uh, the next guest we have lined up is Rob Simmons from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Also, so uh, anyway, so so Steve knows Kim really well. So uh, Steve, would you uh, like to introduce Kim? Sure. Thanks, Will. Uh, so welcome to the CS Education Zoo, everyone. Uh, and I especially want to welcome our special guest, Kimberly Vol, uh, Dr. Kimberly Vol's senior faculty at the Center for Digital Media, where she teaches master students various topics related to interactive digital media. Uh, Kim's done all kinds of stuff. Her PhD was in computer science, but focused on AI. Uh, cognition, gaming, and usability. Uh, she's a martial arts uh, black belt and instructor. Uh, she's a board gamer. She's a published game designer uh, and uh, has done many other things. So without further ado, uh, Kim, do you want to maybe say hi and then we'll ask you some questions? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like well me done. to expand on any of those things or it's just a sort of a general purpose hello kid? <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, one of one of the questions uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, just to start way far afield, was uh, maybe what's the most interesting teaching experience you've had that wasn't computer science? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I happen to have done a lot of, actually, non-CS teaching just because my, my sort of path through academia has been largely interdisciplinary. So I've actually taught in, in medicine, and I've done a lot in cognitive science as well. In terms of my most sort of Interesting, though. Uh, I don't know. Do you want academic or non-academic? Totally up to you. Totally <laughs> up to you. Well, uh, I'll do one of each. So I think one of my most interesting experiences was one of my most formative teaching experiences when I was in university as an undergraduate. I was a fencing instructor, so teaching fencing actually surprisingly factors into a lot of the teaching that I that I do now because it forced me to appreciate how people interpret information that is being given to them in the sense that they have to reproduce that in some capacity and it, uh, you know obviously reproducing physical activities is a very specific manifestation you can really point to things and and there's a there's a talking point around that that starts to starts to potentially break down the more sort of esoteric abstract uh, you go with your concepts and so I think having that formative experience as as a, a physical educator really helped me kind of identify what some of those core issues were so that when it went abstract I had a really good foundation to to apply and then in in academia probably oh that's a hard one probably actually teaching health informatics for for medicine has been one of the most unusual paths that I've, I've sort, of, sort of side jaunts that I've done because it really forced me to be, you know, I'm very used to operating interdisciplinarily within computer science, 
with computer science, of course, being the core focus, everything sort of feeding back into that fundamentally. But in, in medicine, the focus was very different, and I was faced with a sea of folks that didn't necessarily have not only any formal computer science education, but hadn't necessarily grown up with computers in the same way that a lot of our CS students have. So that was really interesting, and it gave me a lot of really really cool insights, and I learned a ton of stuff as well. I, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we'd have students in there who were doing nursing and pharmacology and, and all of these these crazy cool things that, you know, I had never taken in university, so it was, it was pretty fun. Great. Will, should I hand over to you, or should I follow up? Uh, well, if you want to follow up, keep going. Well, all we right. can switch off. That's no problem. So let's let's bring that back to CS then, Kim. So you've taught all over the place. Uh, you've had these interesting experiences, like you said, the, the physical experience with fencing and the the interdisciplinary experience, but where the core of the interdisciplinary work was outside of CS with uh, the health informatics course. How uh, how are what are some ways that that's informed your your teaching in CS? Um, well, I think part of it is coming to recognize very very sort of fundamentally that everything has everything submits to a multitude of perspectives so when when you're teaching a concept if you've kind of gone through the normal focused kind of pathway you know you, you did your undergraduate as a as a computer scientist and, and maybe a master's or straight into a PhD and then you get teaching in that discipline you know there's there's always a risk and I think we have to work really hard to to fight to not get narrowly focused in a particular perspective. But when you work interdisciplinarily, whether you like it or not, <laughs> you're being forced into a bunch of other perspectives. And when you return to the original subject matter, you often find that things are highlighted in a, in a different way. You know, in the same way that y you hold up a mug, you might not realize that it has a handle. But when you come back, now it's on this angle. Like, oh, look at that. That's, that's pretty handy. So I think it's helped me have a lot of opportunities to reach out and connect with students, particularly who are struggling with the material, and provide opportunities for me to find sort of that that point of connection, that, that path through different means than just sort of a lot of the pre-established ways that we, we teach things. And that can be things like, for example, if I know you have an interest in, in medicine, then I can probably come up with now an example that stems from medicine, or I can cast it in those terms. Or at the very least, I can be appreciative of the sorts of, of learning and thinking patterns that are dominant within those disciplines and try to think of ways that I can creatively recast what I'm trying to teach from those particular perspectives. Great. Will, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess one, one thing I'm always interested in is how you how people set up their classrooms or set up their courses like for example you know when I'm setting up a course I, I have certain ways I try to to get to know the students like taking out the lunch and small groups and stuff like that uh, I'm just curious what when you when you're teaching a course um, you know what what sort of things do you like to do or, or how do you how do you like to set up the environment or how do you like to deal with interaction with the students, and you know, an example is like, you know, do you have like a policy with using laptops or cell phones, or do you let people do what they want, or you know, what, what's the sort of environment you want to create, and how are you, how do you want to ideally interact with the students uh, that you're working with? Right. So I mean, that's always a tough question. You you mentioned specifically the laptop one, and that's one that I have, I've gone back and forth on, not because I'm not because I'm giving in in certain situations, but largely because I don't know what the right answer is yet to, to that issue. I think that there's a lot of things to take into consideration. You know, first and foremost, you're in a room full of adults who are paying to be there, and I think that one of the most important things to to a good sort of collegial environment is that you walk in expecting them to behave like adults. You know, we're all... I look at a classroom as a room full of equals, myself among them, and my role in that classroom is just, you know, a little bit different than the other students. But, you know, we're all fundamentally kind of in this together and we're all, I go, I start from the assumption that we're all working together to make this a great classroom environment. So with that in mind, you know, then the laptop issue becomes maybe a little bit more leaning on the side of, oh, you know, you could have your laptops open, use it responsibly, et cetera, et cetera. But I also have a very long history in how the brain works and how distraction works and, and all of these perceptual things and I know that despite how we may see ourselves we are not multitaskers 
we are not capable of multitasking. The best we can do is sort of get a snapshot flipping back and forth between the things that we're trying to attend to, you know, back and forth between the, those, those things. So I know that any kind of distraction along those lines is going to provide an opportunity for people to get pulled into it, whether they like it or not. They may have the best of intentions, they may be great students, but it is a temptation that is is often beyond their conscious control. So, you know, and then that tends to flip me back to, all right, well maybe we shouldn't have laptops. So these days I tend to be laptops closed, and I explain my reasoning, you know, it's not, ah, laptops closed, uh, you guys won't pay attention. I just tell them, look, I, I would be caught getting distracted by this as well, because we're all humans, and here's a little bit of how the brain works and why this is an issue. And typically that, that works well, and sometimes there's a little bit of discussion, people are interested in it, and it, and it seems to be fine. But yeah, in general, I mean, like I say, it's, it's, a, it's a collegial environment that I'm trying to set up. I, I love teaching, and I want to have fun when I'm teaching, and I love, you know, above teaching, I love people, so, you know, I want to have a really friendly, fun environment where people feel comfortable contributing to to that environment so I try to I try to have fun with my teaching so that students can see that I'm having fun and then you know hopefully that breaks down some barriers so that people can start to to contribute a little bit more but I'll proactively pull people in as well um, not the sort of like you answer this question I mean, that's that's terrifying and I find that that often tends to put up walls and then people start to resent those experiences and whether or not on the surface it might be a good idea, I think that it tends to break down a little bit more the the, the trust in in the classroom environment. You know, we're we're a family, and we we all kind of come from different places, and we all have different experiences that have brought us to this this moment, and will affect our interpretation of any given moment. But I think that you know, certainly my responsibility as the teacher in that environment to do my best to contribute to a space that people feel safe and, and welcome in. So, you know, I'll pull people in in, in sort of small doses, uh, sort of like, you know, I do a lot of in-class activities and whatnot, so if students are working in small groups, then I will make sure to visit every single group, and while I'm there, I'll, I'll chit-chat with students a little bit, I'll figure out what they like, I'll, you know, and then when I come back and I see those groups later, I'll re try to my best. <laughs> difficult and I'm getting old, but I'll try my best to remember these things and, and get to know these students as, as people and as people get a little bit more comfortable, you know, I'll look for opportunities then to maybe pull students into broader classrooms, uh, classroom discussions. So for example, if I've had a group working on a particular problem, uh, you know, thinking back to when I was teaching core computer science stuff, you know, maybe they're working on, I don't know, linked lists or something and I would go visit that group, and one of them asks a fantastic question. Well, I remember from my university days, I was an incredibly shy person. I was terrified to put up my hand in, in front of a group of people, you know, which were often, you know, 80 guys that I didn't necessarily know that well. It was, it was scary stuff, and I had a lot of sort of the stereotypical strict teachers that didn't really do much to, to build my confidence. So, you know, if I've had, if I know somebody's asked a really great question, then I might use that opportunity when we all come back as a whole to say, well, you know, so-and-so actually had this awesome question, and I save them the trouble of asking it out loud, but they get the sort of positive reinforcement. And I try to kind of work that stuff in. It's certainly not a perfect system. Uh, it's just sort of what I've kind of come to... Uh, just sort of the general kind of process that I've landed on over the over the years. I also do a lot of open office hours where students come in, and I I try to provide opportunities, you know, a breadth of opportunities for students to to connect with me and feel feel comfortable within those opportunities. Some never will be comfortable talking in front of an entire classroom, and and that's fine. Everybody's everybody's different. Some people are more introverted than others, and you know, some people have histories that make it very difficult for them to to talk in groups, but you know, my door's always open, so hopefully they can at least cross the barrier of coming to, to talk to me. So you, you mentioned um, sort of group activities. Can, can you talk a little more about that? You know, what sort of, you know, how do you, uh, well, I guess maybe to give more context, maybe, you know, sort of the class setup and size um, for one of these examples, and then maybe sort of the activities you would run, and then, you know, uh, how would you structure the time for a lecture or a lab or something like that? And, and what sort of things do you do to try to uh, keep people active if you're doing group activities or what size groups? And, you know, I'm, I'm just curious about those sorts of uh, details. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So one of the things that I've always been a big fan of is working around learning goals and that attempt to have a very clearly articulated distillation of what are the various pieces that you are trying to to teach students. And from there, I structure a lot of my. I mean, I. I broad stroke structure the different units that we're covering and then within those units I structure the individual tasks and I spend a lot of time dissecting the things that that we would do in computer science or, or anywhere I mean I, I teach these days I teach a lot of, of video game design and development so I do comparable things for, for those tasks as well but being able to break those things up into kind of cognitive units the things that you really need to understand foundationally and then to build upon that foundation to have a sufficient sort of cognitive matrix in place to support the things that you're adding on on top. And I spend time looking for trying to figure out how to detect when a student hasn't grasped that. Like when are they really missing some of those foundational things? Because in my early years of teaching I would find myself often in, in situations where I had for whatever reason, assume that students were further along than they actually were. And when it came time to to test that or to to you know build on that concept, things would start falling apart, and I couldn't figure out why. And that sort of blindness and figure out where the holes were in the understanding led me to to keep breaking things up into smaller and smaller units. And as I did that, it forced me to really look at what the core of these things were, and I was able to build activities on on top of that. You know, they were. I were sort of these solid little things that would help me even if they were imperfect but at the very least would help me start to figure out where students were on, on the whole and it also by extension gave me an opportunity when I was doing these as in-class activities which is typically what I would do it gave me a chance to break up the lecture so it stayed more interesting so we could talk a little bit about something I could you know put a problem out there or otherwise ground what we were about to talk about and uh, provide an activity where they they uh, puttered around with some of these ideas, but they would be small enough units that we could do them in short stints, and then I could bring the class back together. We could talk about that, any questions, etc. I could maybe do an example on on, on the board, and we could continue iterate uh, while building up on this on this foundation. It was interesting because when I first started doing this, and I, and I know these kinds of concerns have been echoed throughout the the literature, and a lot of my my colleagues in the past have expressed similar concerns. Because it sounds like, oh my gosh, we're just going to spend so much time on all of this, and yeah, it's a lot of work to set it up from the educational uh, standpoint. You know, especially if it's a new prep, it's going to take a long time. You can keep reusing these exercises. It's not like, you know, linked lists and hash tables and all these things are going out of style. I mean, these are exercises that continue to get refined and and they they improve with time as opposed to having to redo them constantly. But it actually, it, you know, it wasn't that it ended up taking so much time in the classroom. It just bought you a ton of time when it came to time reviewing. It bought me a ton of time when it came to people coming to my office. When they came to my office, it was no longer, I'm stuck. I don't know what I'm doing. It was, I don't get this. This, this specific thing, you did this thing in class. And well, I don't really get the rest of it either, but this foundational piece. And you know, if I could, if in a, a, you know, a half an hour with the student, we could really solidly uh, nail that piece, then oftentimes the other pieces would just fall on top. You know, it was a lot easier to point to the broken chain in this this longer chain of knowledge by by structuring things this way. So it's worked really, really well. Not everything lends itself to this kind of analysis, or maybe it's, it's just me and I don't know how to break it up that way, and, and somebody else will come along and be like, oh, you should do it this way. But certainly wherever it's been possible, I've tried to break things up in that in that manner, and it's worked really, really well. Uh, can, can you give a specific example of something that you think works particularly well with that style and maybe a specific example of something that you're struggling to try to uh, teach in that style or you're not sure how it would map on? Yeah, so I mean a lot of the stuff, the bulk of my my time when I was teaching at the University of British Columbia, I was teaching the Data Structures and Algorithms course, which is actually one of my favorite courses to teach. It's so much fun. It's it's just it's so foundational. It's the first sort of interesting step where you take all of the the basic like this is a variable and you know the, the basics that you do in computer science and you start to combine them into meaningful units and you start to really appreciate what computer science is rather than just programming. I mean, that's the kind of the magic that starts to emerge. So a lot of the things that 
you do within a typical data structures and algorithms course include things like, you know, I mentioned linked lists, you might do hash tables, you might do, uh, you know, various types of, of trees. And given that these are discretized structures to begin with, they lend themselves very, very well to this kind of breakdown. So you can start with, you know, this is the base case and you build off of, of these different things. So a lot of the activities that I really put a lot of my energy in creating in this fashion were, were in the data structures and algorithms uh, realm. Algorithms, you know, when you start getting into stuff like uh, proofs and whatnot, I mean, those get a little bit trickier. Some do submit nicely, like inductive logic programming. It's super easy to do in this hierarchical kind of, of relationship. But when you start looking at sort of just general kinds of proofs, uh, it gets a little tricky because there's, there's, while you can... Teaching proofs has always been, I think, one of the hardest things to teach, partly because you can show anybody a proof and you can walk them through the proof and, and you know, if you do a decent enough job and it's not too, too complex, it'll make sense. Say, oh, yeah, I can see that. But that's not ever what we're asking people to do. Right? We're always asking people to say, you know, or, or later on, we're trying to set them up so that they can look at uh, some sort of problem and they can come up with a proof for that. And that independent generation of a solution. I mean, that doesn't necessarily break down to a clean-cut uh, hierarchical kind of approach, right? It tends to be a little bit more of a, almost a breadth-first search, you know? You kind of you sniff around down here, and like, oh, it looks like I might be going the right way, but maybe not. And you sniff around down here, and you sniff around down here, and you gradually sort of unfold, and you figure out what your dead ends are, and you, you prune, and you keep going. That's, that's pretty hard to do because you've got this sort of holistic uh, piece of knowledge for somebody that's done a lot of these proofs. You've got all of this information in your head that you're bringing to bear on the problem at any given moment and there's a lot of, of connections and, and things that are being drawn and this sort of, you know, what we like to talk about from the cognitive science perspective, you know, you chunk knowledge as you attain expertise, things chunk into meaningful units. Well, somebody who is new to this does not have those chunks but we have the chunks, so we have to be able to divorce, divorce ourselves from those chunks and translate that into a meaningful task that starts to, to identify some of this process. And I think it's really, really difficult. I think that is something that could use a lot of, a lot of, of study. If nothing else, then it's also very stressful for students, you know, and it's hard to uh, lay some of that fear especially when it's all, it's all well and good to say, well, you know, just keep playing with it and eventually you'll, you'll get it, you'll massage it into something. You know, sometimes proofs take a really long time. That doesn't really hold up when you're saying, but you've only got three hours to complete this final exam, so good luck with the proofs. You know, people are terrified by proofs. So I think that there's, there's a lot of stuff that can be done there, and I certainly don't think that I have, I have made any great contributions there. I think there's still lots, lots of questions to be answered, and I, there's lots of great people that are, that are working on, on that stuff as well. Yeah, I think uh, when Rob comes on, he'll he'll talk about the the CMU approach to this because I I think for one of their intro courses, they're actually trying to get the students to prove all all their programs correct uh, for like a first first semester class. Um, and I'd like to hear a lot more details about that and how they try to 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 get over that fear and mm -hmm. the fact that it's less structured. Uh, okay, so I, I got two more related questions for you, and then I'll hand it back over to Steve. Uh, because you're involved in games, uh, you know, there's a particular class of students that I've interacted with when I was at Indiana University, for example, who they came, they came to school because they, they wanted to program games, and they were bummed out because IU doesn't really have a, a big games program, and they were told, study computer science for four years, learn, sort, learn you know, take a, a course on ray tracing or whatever, and then after four years, go work for a game company and, and do games. And, and for some students, that was not a, an answer they wanted to hear, and they got very turned off. The other thing is that sometimes I'd have very good students who wanted to go into games, and it seemed like it was, uh, it seems like it's very difficult even to get an unpaid internship at like a AAA game company right now, especially if you don't have much game experience, or game development experience. So, you know what, uh, I guess the first part of the question is, 
uh, how, how do we help the students who really want to develop games? Um, do you think a traditional CS education is the best way to go, or do you think something more game-oriented is better? And then secondly, for the students who are very good but maybe don't have a lot of game development experience, what's, what should they be spending their summers doing ideally and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a great question. I get asked that a lot, and it's something that I've spent a lot of time reflecting on. Um, I think that I think that there's a lot to be said for a more, if you will, traditional computer science degree. I mean, what that gives you is a solid foundation. It gives you all the tools in your toolbox and at least some experience rifling through those tools and figuring out what is is the appropriate choice. And that has applications in all sorts of domains, including video game development. It's not like a natural segue necessarily to move into video game development and I think that there are definitely holes that exist that the students who are aspiring to move into that industry must fill and, and it is a challenge. But I think that there are ways to smooth that segue through you know, other programs, special topics courses, summer studies, things like that. And so that would take the form of my number one biggest piece of advice that I cannot stress enough. If you want to go into the games industry, you make games. For some students, it's like, well, we don't have any games courses. That's fine. You make games. You go make games. You know, students who really want to get into this industry have to be able to get over that inertia to get themselves in a mindset where they are developing games. They might be developing crappy games. That's okay. They're developing games. And a lot of students, you know, I would say of all of the students that have asked me to get into the video game industry, like some you know, advice for that, that path. Probably close to 60% of all computer science students I have taught have asked me that question. Of that 60%, maybe 10% of them, I, on a good day I might say 20%, will have actually made any attempt at making a game. I'd say of that 10 to 20%, maybe 5% of those have actually gone through the steps of completing a game. So that includes like doing all the user interface, all of those ugly bits that you have to contend with when you set upon doing something as challenging as, as that. And of that, maybe another 5% have actually published anything. So now we're getting down to very, very, very small percentage of folks who have actually gone through and, and done this entire thing. And yet that's what they need. Making games is extremely difficult. It's difficult for a multitude of reasons. One is that it is a fundamentally interdisciplinary task. Whether or not you yourself are taking it upon yourself to, to see yourself through those interdisciplinary tasks, i.e. doing the art, doing the UI, doing the game design, doing all of these different pieces, I mean, that's, that's a possible route. And for many people, for their first games, that is exactly the route that they take. And that's, that's great. That's fine. But uh, for others, it involves working with other people with those, those skill sets. And I think that that is one of the big holes that exists in a lot of the traditional computer science programs right now. It's not universal by all means, and I know a lot of great people are making strides in this area. That ability to work interdisciplinarily, to know how to talk to an artist, for example, to know what that asset pipeline, pipeline even looks like, I mean, that's stuff that our Typically, our students graduate without any knowledge. And so when they go into the industry and someone's looking at their resume, and they're like, well, what experience do you have? And they're like, well, you know, I, I programmed an air traffic control simulator for my projects course. It's like, well, OK. <laughs> you and all the rest of the, the class did that. You, you don't have any creative expression in a lot of this. You don't have any experience working with, with graphical assets. And I'm not talking about doing all of the ugly Java GUI stuff that we often teach. I'm talking about like what is what is real user interface? What is um, what are the actual tools that are available out there? There's a lot of of UI tools, for example, that are used. You, you don't you rarely in the games industry would you hard code the the UI from scratch. You'd use a bunch of other tools. Maybe you're developing in Unity. There's Unity. There's things like NGUI. The new Unity Five is going to have a whole suite of of uh, tools for that kind of thing. So there's all of these other things, and our students don't have any exposure to these. And they haven't necessarily worked with artists, so like I said, they don't know those pipelines and all of those. So those are all really, really, really big things. And on top of that, they haven't gone through the full development process. So they haven't set out to, to uncover as they go along 
exactly why it is so hard to make a game. So they don't know about, you know, they figure, well, it's just like another programming project, right? I mean, how hard can it be? It's just, it's interactive. That's the difference. But making something interactive and understanding what it means to engage people, to be able to truly iterate, to actually do rapid prototyping. You know, a lot of students, I think, have absolutely no idea what rapid prototyping is coming out of their degree. And, and it's hard to blame them because it's hard for us as the, as the instructors to set up experiences that really support true rapid prototyping. I mean, the program where I teach now, the master's program, it, it's, it's great in that we only have you know, 40 or 50 students for, for our faculty, so we can work really closely with the students. And you know, I'll be supervising a team of six students, and that will be my team for the semester. So it, it, it really frees me up to be able to push them for rapid prototyping and doing all of these things. But when I'm staring at 150 faces in a computer science class, I mean, how could I reasonably facilitate a rapid prototyping environment? I can't really. And so we see the same thing. It collapses into everybody doing the same project across the board and you know it's a it's a utilitarian thing as much as anything but it does leave some some pretty big holes so students can do kind of bring it around full circle I think students can do a few different things personal projects students need to really embrace the personal project I know I mean I've been there I've done it I know school is a lot of hard work I know there's a lot of things to do but spending some time you know if you just dedicate a few hours a week to work on your own personal project will go a huge way Learn how to do a proper portfolio. A portfolio is not a canonical list of I did this, I did this, I did this. It's a list of I did this, and here's the challenges that I faced here. That's how I solved these challenges. Here's the algorithm that I came up with, or here's the software package that I learned and then had to apply. Here are the other people that I had to work with in order to solve this problem. That's far more interesting to a potential employer than, you know, yeah, I did the airport traffic controller. Yeah, I did, you know, the projects that everybody else did. I mean, those, those aren't meaningful. Students need to recognize how to cast things such that an employer looking at their, their resume can look at that and see, yes, I can make use of that. Like, that's relevant to me. That's relevant to my team, as opposed to something that looks like, like everybody else. So doing those projects, uh, game jams. There's so many game jams happening. You know, I ran Global Game Jam for, for many years. Uh, it's an opportunity for, for people to come together on a weekend, so it's like a nice bite sizey kind of uh, opportunity to go through something that is the closest you're going to get to a real-world game development cycle that isn't in the real world in some loose sense. I mean, it is the real world, but you know, it gives you an opportunity to work with strangers that you've never met, um, people from the industry who maybe be, might be industry veterans, to work with artists, to work with you know all sorts of different people, and you set all share. You all come together into this shared challenge of let's make a game this weekend. A lot of employers these days are looking at whether or not students have been doing game jams. A lot of my students that get interviewed get ex asked exactly that. Well, how many game jams have you done? If you're saying zero today, that's a real problem because there's so many available out there. Saying zero five years ago, well, nobody knew what a game jam was hardly five years ago. That's different. But there are so many opportunities out there. And then finally, look where you live. Look at your community and get involved with, with local meetup groups if they exist. If you're in Vancouver, for example, uh, or there's other large communities like Boston and San Francisco and Toronto, we all boast very large independent game developer meetup groups. Here in Vancouver, I run Full Indie, which is our local group. We have 2,000 people that are a part of this who are all independent game developers. They make their living doing that. And a lot of, uh, a lot of great things come out of this group. If you show up as somebody who's working your way on a game and you need some help, these are awesome, open, wonderful communities. So you can connect with these people. You can get amazing advice. You can share in the expertise that has been hard, hard wrought from these folks who've been making it in this industry for some time. So they're great learning experiences. They're great doses of perspective for somebody aspiring toward that, uh, to that industry. And my final point would just be to say that the industry itself is shifting quite dramatically. And while there are still big AAA companies out there, the model is shifting toward more of an independent game developer, partly because of the high saturation of the market and the difficulty out there in being able to recoup the costs of a high production value game. So students need to be aware of these kind of industry trends. Going out to these meetups and stuff will, will help them keep apprised of that, but also it helps them understand that they better have a high degree of initiative if they're going to survive in this industry and, and they better take some steps to figure out what it's really about. Okay, that was great. That's 
That's exactly the sort of answer I wish I had had a couple of years ago. Uh, all right, so Steve, do you want to? Um, do you have any more questions? And then maybe after you've asked a question or two, we can uh, open it up to to anyone else who has questions. Sure. Um, so Kim, it's it's summer, which means we're all just stacked up with free time, right? Um, so so what should we uh, what should we be putting on our summer reading list? And I put reading in big quotes here. I, I'm really asking what's something you think uh, every s computer scientist should uh, should take the chance to read, to learn, to do, to play with, uh, to build something with, or whatever. Hmm, gosh. Well, my reading list is hugely varied. <laughs> you can see a little bit, I think, behind me some of the books that I have here. And they run the gamut from, you know, neuroscience to philosophy to, you know, the art of games. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff there. Um, I think that actually, I don't know, I think that I would suggest that you should get out there and you should make a game. So what does that mean exactly? Well, uh, I, I happen to firmly believe that even if you have zero aspirations of entering into the game industry, the nature of the challenges you are faced when you are putting together a game will serve you in every other field you could apply your programming skills. It is definitely a worthwhile exercise. So I don't say that tongue-in-cheek or in some sort of backhanded way to try to get everybody to become game programmers. Uh, I really do think it has huge value. So, you know, a great summer reading task uh, might be reading up on Unity, for example, which is the current dominant engine in the game development world. And having a little bit of that under your belt, if you are aspiring toward the industry, will only help you. But it's a great exercise. It shows you a different way of of programming. It provides. It's not. Uh, it's um. Uh, what's the phrase? Component-based program. As programming. Sorry, as opposed to traditional object-oriented programming. So it provides a little bit of of some situational kind of some context, if you will, for why we program in certain ways and why you might not always want to do object-oriented, uh, you know, or sometimes why you might. I mean, there are times when I wish there were different ways of doing things um, in, in the ways that I'm developing things for games and sometimes are, are available. But it's, it's just, it's such good knowledge for you. Uh, it's a great prototyping tool as well. So I was just talking about how hard it is to facilitate rapid prototyping in the classroom environment. But if our students were using tools like Unity, I mean, that doesn't need to be the exclusive uh, tool of education, but I, I do think it is, it is good, uh, that would provide an opportunity for us to set up different kinds of activities later on in, in the program. You know, if you, if you teach, for example, Unity in first or second year, or you have a Unity club, or you have some means by which students can, can learn this, even if it's opt-in, that provides a lot of opportunities later on for students to do more advanced things, to actually start playing around with prototyping, and frees them to be able to prototype some things on their own time without quite as much overhead as you might face if you were doing everything from, from scratch. So I know it's not exactly reading, but there's lots of books on Unity. I think you're probably going to want to watch tutorials and whatnot. But whatever, whatever your, whatever your fancy, that may include a reading list. No, that that's good. That's good. That can be on my uh, on my. I can't believe it's not reading list. <laughs> Fantastic. Should we uh, should we open up the floor, Will? Uh, yeah, sure. So. I'm not sure the best way to do this. I mean, I guess we could go left to right according to the icons on the bottom or something and see poll people if they had. Uh, are so, so uh, uh, sorry. Are those persistent? Like, do I have the same uh, array of icons as you? I wonder. Well, I don't know. I th I've got Alex on the lower left. Are you there, Alex? Can you yeah, I do too. I don't know if he's. Uh, if oh, there he's we go. It's alphabetical. Oh, okay. Uh, Alex, do you have any uh, questions? All right. Well, I guess. Okay. Just all right. Uh, you know, let's put it another way. Does you know? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, we can keep asking questions all day. But anyone who has questions, uh, actually, maybe typing in the group chat is is good. That might be a good way to do it. So, uh, if you type in the group chat, uh, then Kim can can pick what questions she wants to answer. <laughs> uh, so that's, that might be a reasonable way to do it. Impress me uh, with your questions. Yeah. Does, does anyone have a, a burning question that they want to ask right away? Well, well while we wait, 
Let me ask this one. Uh, Kim, you, you happen to know the curriculum at UBC, where I am. Um, so let's say we, we invited you back and we said, Kim, we want you to teach a course, and it can be any course you want. What's, what's the course you would come back and teach here? Uh, gosh. It would, it would probably, be, probably be something fairly applied. So either applied game design or an applied projects course of, of some form in an upper third or fourth year where I could really I could really go through a lot of the things that I have seen out in, in industry and sort of start to help students better prepare their portfolios and, and understand the needs out in, in industry. Because there's this sort of well, there's this this tendency toward wanting to get everything perfect within computer science, which is awesome. I mean, computer science programming, all these algorithms are beautiful. It's, it, I think recursion is one of the sexiest things in the world. But the reality of programming for industry isn't necessarily so sexy. You know, the reality is sometimes we don't write code that we might want to post on the fridge at home. Sometimes we don't write code that we want to show our colleagues. So how do you how do you mitigate that? How do you deal with the situation where you have a very real deadline, uh, or you have very real resource constraints, time of which being one of those resources? But how do you deal with that? How do you determine that this feature hits the cutting room floor, this one stays? You know, this one has been this one has tested well with people, so we need to keep this, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how do you play around with all of these these variables? It's not it's not very clear cut, and where where do you spend your time optimizing things? You know, you, you won't last very long in industry if you try to optimize everything that you ever code. I mean, I know I'm sort of like the dirty, horrible computer science instructor forever saying that thing out loud, but it's true. You, you just won't make it. What you have to know, and, and you know, when we're teaching people how to establish the, the efficiency of a particular piece of code, is will this matter? When does this actually matter? Is this going into something that is, is being displayed every frame? Am I doing this calculation every single frame? Well then, yeah, I better think a little bit about making sure that that is an optimal solution, or at least is an optimized solution. But if it's one call that happens when the rest of the game is loading, for example, super game biased, obviously, then it can take a while. It doesn't necessarily have to be optimized. You are better spending your resources on making sure that one call that's happening every frame is is being called properly. So setting up situations where people can understand that and they can start to be exposed to making those those decisions, you know, where you're really operating under a time crunch, not just because you left it to the last minute, but I'm actually providing tasks that you can't reasonably accomplish to the level of, of perfection that you want. So you have to make intelligent choices about what makes it through to the other side. I think something like that would be kind of an, an ideal course. And yeah, probably would be video games, but it doesn't have to. Are there any particularly good experiences you had, or particularly good classes or teachers that really stood out when you were, um, you know, a student at the college level in computer science, or anything else, or you know, are there any people who you consider like exemplars, like, hey, I want to, I want to try to channel some of that when I teach? Uh, I, I had a few really awesome teachers. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sad to say that my approach to teaching often came from the, the what not to do approach, where I had some not so positive experiences and I, I really I reflected on them a lot probably more than I should have and it, so it left me with some insights uh, as to how I wanted to be as a, as a professor so I mean in some sense I can thank those folks because they contributed to to where I am today but no I certainly had some some great experiences and a lot of them were I mean the things that really stand out to me today are the, the professors that had humor in the classroom, that were creating an environment where I felt like I was part of, where I wasn't equal, as opposed to somebody that I sort of had to cower down and I was too afraid to ask questions. Because when I wasn't afraid to ask questions, I, I asked them and I learned and I was able to broaden and, and push my understanding of things well beyond what I would ever have accomplished by sitting there quietly and being afraid to, to say anything. So for those professors, I mean, I can't thank them enough for for providing those opportunities to me. One of them in particular, really, funnily enough, data structures and algorithms course, uh, I was really, I, I, I used to sort of fetishize certain parts of computer science as I was going through it. You know, I, I'd hear about this thing and it's like, 
oh, fuzzy logic, fuzzy logic is so cool, and I want to do everything about fuzzy logic, and you know, all of these different, there's a few kind of things that universally stuck with me. Like, I've always, I've been doing AI for as long as I can remember and loved everything about it, so that's one of the sort of universals. But one of the times I happened upon constraint theory, and this is just, this was it, this was the new coolest thing that I had ever seen in computer science, it was all constraint, constraint satisfaction. And my data structures and algorithms professor at the time happened to have a lab where he was doing constraint satisfaction. And he was pretty open to questions, and so I just sort of started asking him about it. And he was awesome. He invited me to the lab. Here I was, this, you know, dorky little undergraduate. Like, what would I possibly have to contribute as a second-year university student in the esteemed halls of this lab that was populated by master's and doctoral students? Like, oh, my goodness. But no, he's like, get in here. He invited me. So I you know, very trepidatiously made my way to the lab, and knocked on the door, and they were very welcome. He brought me in, and he included me in conversations and just made me feel a part of it. I, I mostly sat there quietly, but it wasn't like, okay, I don't exist. It, you know, he would explain things to me, and he would draw diagrams, and then he would ask me afterward, like, well, what did you think about that? And he made it okay for me to say, I had no idea what anybody was talking about. Like, And, you know, he would reassure me. It's like, well, yeah, these guys have been doing it for years, and blah, 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 and, and all of this, this stuff. And so that, that was awesome. I think that was, was fantastic. And I think one of the ways in which that translated into my experiences as a, a teacher, particularly at UBC, uh, was that when students came to me and asked me to do research with me, I know a lot of times the, the sort of traditional response is, well, you know, sort of you got to apply, or there's formal channels to go through, and then they look at your GPA and, and all of these different things. And I, I figured that if somebody had taken the initiative to walk through my door to ask to do something with me, that I could come up with something they could do with me, and I didn't care what their grades were. If they didn't do a very good job, well, I'd tell them they didn't do a very good job. I mean, it would be a learning opportunity. If they gave up and wandered away, well, that's, that's fine. They gave up and they wandered away. But that basically never happened. Every single student, I said, "Sure. What are you interested in? Let's do something. Let's. You're excited. You've taken initiative. I'm going to do everything that I can to foster that. Because if nothing else, I think that's my role as a teacher is to help engender that kind of excitement around ideas. And so we we did all sorts of cool things. I mean, sometimes they were way off the beaten path of anything that I was currently teaching. You know, we did we did projects in like multi-agent systems and video games and and like rendering and you name it. We did all sorts of things. And sometimes I didn't have a lot of expertise in that area, so it was sort of fun for me to, to learn along the way. But in all cases, the students were, it was an unlocking of sorts with them. You know, they would open up. They, they were finally, many of them had been turned down for opportunities because, you know, there. I understand why there are standards in place. I mean, we, we can't just, we're going to die if we try to do this for everybody. I totally understand that. But I think that uh, when students are are given an opportunity like that to work with a professor, it is it is profound. It makes a huge, huge difference. You know, I had a professor when I was an undergraduate, and, I, and I've always been a super self-directed learner, lots and lots of initiative. I, I just I love learning things. I especially love learning things about programming and games and AI and all of that. And he was doing some, some AI work, and like I said, I've got a long history with AI. And I wanted to do some work in it in that area. And so I asked him, having had this other experience with this great professor, I asked him, you know, is there any way I could get involved in your lab in some capacity? Like, I'll just sit there quietly. And the first words out of his mouth were, well, I don't know, what's your GPA? And I wasn't even allowed through the door until I had, I had given him. And my GPA was great. I mean, it was like four point something. It was, right, you know, it was around four. And uh, he, he thought about it. He was actually like, hmm, I don't know. Like, really? So I, I, I gave up. I, I just said thank you, and then I just didn't follow up with it. Uh, and I was crushed. I thought, like, oh, my gosh, I'm an idiot. I can't, I can't make it in these circles. And, you know, it was just, just terrible. So I don't ever want to be a person that, that does that. I, I, want it. I take it very seriously, engendering learning and helping students build the confidence. And students are all over the map. You know, some of them are more confident than others. Some of them really require that extra push. But if I can help them take that step, toward becoming someone who really opens up and starts to blossom in, in this discipline, or if nothing else takes this knowledge to another discipline and starts to blossom there, then you know I'm, I'm all in. I'm going to do whatever I can. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, I guess whenever 
if I ever feel like I'm in danger of, of that sort of attitude, I just remind myself that uh, some of the brightest people I know like failed out of college, and <laughs> I don't know if I'm one of the brightest people I know, but I also failed out of college. So <laughs> it was because of people, you know, willing to take a chance on me that I was able to kind of get to where I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. So Steve, you uh, you have any more questions? Let's just check uh, once more around the circle here if anybody's got questions to jump in with, and uh, otherwise I can I can ask more. But I don't I don't believe that Leaf doesn't have a question. Well, I've actually got <laughs> one at the moment. Okay, Chris. Um, I work with a lot of chemical engineers, uh, and uh, and a lot of them don't have a lot of programming background, and they're just kind of expected to pick up programming along the way. And some of them are taking computer science classes, but they're supposed to be working immediately. And so I often get questions asked of me um, of, you know, well, how should I do this? How should I do that? And I, I try and mix in not only answering their direct question, but a little bit broader not knowledge to try and help them out. And my background has no education experience whatsoever. So I was just wondering if you had any advice given that format that you've talked a lot about more formal classes and things to help out students uh, prepare for industry, but for those who need to be programming immediately, do you have any advice? Yeah, that's always a really, that's a really hard one. Um, I, I like what you said about kind of providing a little bit greater context to anything that you are, are talking about, and I think that that's, that's key right there. That's, that's, the, that's the primary thing. You know, at no point when you sit down with somebody, I mean, it all depends on the nature of the relationship with them. If you know you're going to be able to spend a lot of time, then maybe you can uh, create some larger structure, but assuming that it's sort of an occasional thing that happens in the context maybe of another class or it's just a one-off uh, thing, then you know, you're certainly not able to divulge an entire course worth of material or foundation material in that, that time frame. So what I try to do is I try to figure out what's the nature of the problem that they are trying to solve or the nature of problems that they see themselves trying to solve. Sometimes they don't necessarily have that question. They're just like, I need to know how to program, so how do I do that? So I find out a little bit more about them, the kind of things that they, they do, and then I try to peel back the layers a little bit and figure out what is the, you know, can I start to peek under the rug and see what some of the supporting structures are of those things that they need to know and teach maybe a little bit back from there. Because it does a couple things. One is it provides a little bit better foundation, so the things that you are then trying to impart that are directly relevant have something to kind of hang on. But also, if you can get them comfortable with a little bit more foundational material, then when you teach them the newer stuff or the next stuff, uh, it gives them a little bit of confidence because they have the ability now to start to connect some of those those dots. I mean, that's that's what our, our limbic system rewards us for, you know, is, is drawing these kinds of conclusions and, and detecting these patterns and whatnot. So you're most likely to develop a positive association and continue to want to learn these things if you can situate it such that you're getting these, these little rewards, these little bursts. You know, if your brain is drugging you to continue, that's a great thing. That, that helps a lot. So I think that it's got that kind of added benefit as well, that if they know how this works, they can see, oh, yeah, right, because da, da, da. You, know, you want those aha moments to, to be happening because it builds those positive associations and hopefully helps push them over the threshold of continuing to, to work on these things themselves. Part of the challenge also is that there's, I mean, computer science, I've spent you know, my entire life, I've spent well over 30 years programming, and I think I know maybe 5% of what's out there to know when it comes to, to computer science. I mean, it's just huge. There's just so many different things. It's, you know, it's the, the, the age-old joke among computer scientists where, you know, you focus on, like, for me, I've spent most of my career in AI, and somebody will come, can you fix my computer? I'm like, well, probably not. <laughs> you know, unless it's an AI problem, then, then I'm set. You know, it's just, there's, it's so broad, and, you know, people are like, what do you mean you can't fix it? I thought you were a computer scientist. Oh, never mind. <laughs> you know, just bring it to Best Buy. It's fine. So, ha figuring out what parts are are relevant to any given discipline and what are the core kind of principles are, you know, is really really important. So, you know, it can be things as basic as do they really understand what a variable is? Uh, do they understand what typing is? Do they? Does it matter? Will they need to know what typing is? What kind of languages could they be using in that discipline? You know, if they're if they're going to be using uh, 
high-end game engine things are going to be doing very particular things. If they're going to be using, say, statistical packages like you know, R or MATLAB or whatnot, then that supports one particular style of programming. Are they working in, you know, engineers tend to work a lot in, in C, doing very rudimentary stuff. You know, they don't need to know about object-oriented programming. I mean, it might be interesting to us. I, I love OOP. I think, and I do a lot of work in, in knowledge structures and stuff, so it's got this nice, nice connection there, but I'm probably not going to delve into the finer details of, of OOP if I'm dealing with somebody that is only ever working in R, for example. So kind of having that that knowledge um, in your in your tool belt so that you can make some intelligent decisions about what to cut, what not to cut, and what are the actual fundamental un underpinnings. And then just kind of, I don't know, it's practice, right? I mean, sometimes I start down a path, I'm like, oh, why am I teaching them this? I have no idea why I started down this path. And then you're like, oh, well, anyway, <laughs> you, know, you try to save the session. But you get a little bit better at kind of assessing holistically what is needed and sort of planting yourself at a good spot to, to start to build some good foundations. May I ask a follow-up to that? Sure. By the way, I'm Petey. I got here late. Um, hi, Petey. Hi. And, um, I've occasionally been in teaching circumstances where somebody wants to know something and then quickly realizes it's going to take more effort than they want to put in or more time than they want to put in. And sometimes I recognize that and I say, just say, look, you know, this is, there's, there's, there's a certain level of, of teaching we can do here, sort of the, the Bohr model versus quantum theory, <laughs> right? I'll give you a close enough approximation for what you want, but sometimes what they want and what they need is genuinely, they're going to have to put in some time for that. Mm -hmm. And then they sometimes will actively resist. And I say, no, no. What you need in, involves a lot of work, and I'm happy to walk you through this, but but I'm getting a lot of resistance. Um, do you have any ideas about how I can help people? I mean, ultimately, they have to choose to learn. They have to choose to put in that effort. I can't do it for them. But what ideas do you have about how I can teach or how I can interact with people, how I can structure my teaching, whatever it is, to encourage them and make it easiest for them to do that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I mean, that's something I think we all, ourselves, struggle with whether or not we're totally consciously aware of it is that that kind of that that barrier that resistance to okay I want to I want to do this thing mm -hmm. and I'm trying to kind of keep it focused on what I'm doing and I think I need to know that but that looks big and scary and I don't know if I need to invest that time or it's, it's quote unquote wasted time you know right, especially right. when you're on a deadline and stuff so I totally appreciate that uh, I love the Bohr model analogy by the way I did a few years of chemistry when I was in university and that was the biggest letdown for me that in high school they taught the Bohr model. I said, like, what? There's nothing like that. Anyway, I, I'm still bitter. I'm not a chemist. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Anyhow, so what I will try to do in situations like that is, well, I work a lot with analogies or something approximating analogies, which itself is a bit circular sounding, but I'll try to sort of hang things on broader examples to feel out what do they really want to know. Because sometimes in those situations, Part of the reason what they're asking about seems like it's uncovering this entire field in which you could do your own PhD in is because they don't actually know the problem that they're trying. You know, like there's a misunderstanding, some sort of fundamental misunderstanding about the problem that they're trying to address. So sometimes if I poke at it long enough, I'm like, ah, actually you could just do this. <laughs> you know, and it's, it turns out this is really short thing. So I'll kind of sniff around and make absolutely sure that that's really, or at least as sure as I can, that's really where they, they need to go. Uh -huh. and, and then I try to spend time understanding where they're coming from. Like, what's motivating them to solve this this problem? Where where is it coming from? How is this going to feed into into their matrix? And try to look for ways where I can try to stitch that knowledge in there and show them the value. Because if I don't do that, then the the worry is that I'm just a person that's sitting there who's this you know so-called expert in computer science, and I'm like, oh, I'm just you know. I'm just this fetishist that really, really likes this particular subdomain, and you know, there's that harder. It's harder to get the buy-in because you're probably just, oh, you know, experts. Here they go, blah, blah, blah. So how can I bring it around so that they can actually see the value in this, and and that the time has to be spent to to learn this. So you know, I'll just kind of try to get to know them a little bit, and then I might kind of throw them a few crumbs, you know, like start to solve a bit of something or show them a little bit of something and give give them a chance to see how it could work, and then have them try it, and in their attempting to try it, start to point to, well, you need to understand this, you need to understand this, you need to, you know, all of these different 
different things to hopefully try to to motivate them. Um, but you're totally right. I mean, they have to they have to buy in, and despite your best efforts, they may walk away saying thank you very much and never touch it again because they think you're crazy. And you can't always you can't right. always fix that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're coming up on about an hour here. Let's see. Is there is there anyone else who has uh, uh, questions? Well, what, one one question I have is, and we can either lead out with this, or uh, maybe some other folks have, have things they want want to know. Uh, but one question I have is. For people who are just beginning to teach, you know, that might be grad students, maybe undergraduates, instructors, maybe new professors or high school students or whoever it is, you know, do you have any uh, words of wisdom or you know personal things that you wish you had known when you were starting to teach that you'd like to share? I think the biggest reveal that I had when I started teaching was that professors don't know everything. That was shocking to me. I, I, you know, it sounds ridiculous because I was an adult at that point. I should have probably pieced it together, but I had them, they were held in such a revered status to me that I thought, oh my gosh, you know, here I am teaching. I'm going to get found out any moment now for not knowing absolutely everything there is to know about computer science. But as I got to know my colleagues and, you know, they'd come to me and ask for advice and I'd ask them, you know, like we just, we became colleagues and from that we became friends. I realized, well, actually, they, they don't know everything. They're, you know, they're, they're human. They're kind of like me. Huh. And that was so, so freeing for me. You know, it, it, it really helped me recognize that it's not my job to know absolutely everything. It's my job to help students down a path of lifelong learning and to create basically curated experiences that will help facilitate that, that learning. And sure, I might not know how to answer a question in, in lecture, for example, and, and that's always for new, time, new teachers, that's terrifying. That is absolutely the scariest thing that will happen to you. And it will happen a lot. It, it will, and you gradually, you get used to it, and you come up with tools for it, and you realize that, you know, it's not, it's not a failing on you. And sometimes students will call you out on it, but mostly, actually, they're, they're awesome about it. You can just, you know, usually what I'll say is, you know what? I don't know that one. Let me let me. I'll circle back with it. Let me go figure it out, and I'll come back with it. Or if I'm I'm feeling ambitious, or or I have the time, I'll just work it out right then in in front of them. That usually comes when you get a little more comfortable, though. I don't recommend doing that to to start because it can be it can be a little bit intimidating, and you end up off the beaten path, and then you feel worse, and then it just can snowball really really quickly. But yeah, I think the biggest thing is it's okay not to know everything. It's totally okay to admit you don't know everything. Uh, you know, you're not just, hey guys, I don't know why you're here to listen to me because I don't know anything, but you know, that's, that's different than not knowing, not knowing anything is different than not knowing everything. Figure out the value and what it is that you do know. Answer the question for yourself of what are you actually bringing to the classroom and then, and then play to that strengths. And spend a lot of time reflecting on the educational experiences that you have had. What's worked for you, what didn't work for you. You want to keep in mind that you are not representative of all possible learners, that there are a lot of different learning styles out there. And just because somebody is struggling with something doesn't mean that they're an idiot or whatnot. We all have been quote unquote idiots at various points. We all have struggled with something. We all have been like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I missed that. Uh, or we just continue to miss things and we don't know why. So there's lots of different reasons for that. So you want to be as forgiving as you might be of yourself. You want to be as forgiving or if not more forgiving of, of your students. And when you spend that time reflecting on the past experiences that you've had, try to dissect those opportunities. Like, why did that work for you? How might that work for other students? You know, what other kinds of learning styles are out there? Do some research. A lot of people have written about learning styles and, and whatnot. But no matter what, always remain open-minded. There is this amazing tapestry of students out there in front of you. Uh, and if you come to them with respect and patience and excitement and passion for what you are doing, they will respond in, in turn. And if you remember to keep an open mind, to be open to, to criticism and, uh, you know, responsive in the classroom, you know, being able or willing to, to change, then you're going to have a pretty, I think, a pretty successful uh, classroom. The only times I have really seen people struggle 
in, in a teaching environment where I've seen kind of like a breakdown of the classroom integrity has been typically when when the faculty are too immovable. And sometimes they're immovable because they feel like they have a really tight schedule they have to keep or they're, they're uncomfortable in the classroom and so they don't want to venture off of what they've become comfortable with. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons and it's not that they're bad people, it's just that there's, there's reasons behind this. But try to avoid that. Don't be immovable. Be open. Be dynamic. Get out in the classroom. You know, there's... You don't want to go so far as to say you're being your student's friends because then you start to blur a lot of lines. So that's... It's not that. But you can still be friendly with your students. You can still have have a, uh, an environment of, of, you know, mutual respect. You can still have fun. You can still, you know, you can still treat your students like you were at that time. You know, you were... You were a student, and you were there, and you were, uh, you know, you had a lot to, to learn, but it didn't mean that you were an idiot. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind. Um, and I think it'll, it'll be awesome. Teaching super, super fun, and people are, are super amazing. If you leave your minds open, they will continue to surprise and reward you, which was, uh, which is, uh, which is awesome. I just saw PD's response there. <laughs> yeah, I was probably an idiot too, but you know, I'm remembering back fondly. You know how memories are. <laughs> But, but yeah, even if it looks like they're being an idiot, or they are an idiot, uh, treat them treat them with respect. Believe in them before they believe in themselves, and they will go a lot further. All right. Um, so we should probably come to a close, Will, you think? I think so, unless anyone else has any uh, uh, parting questions or... Or if there's anything else, I guess we should uh, leave it with Kim. Is there, is there anything else you want to say, or is there anything, uh, you know, are there any questions we didn't ask that we should have asked you that you want to answer? Oh uh, no, that was a pretty good array of questions. That that was uh, that was fun. Um, I guess I could just maybe as a parting remark say that uh, you know these days, so I, I I do a lot of work in video games. I do a lot of work in in interfaces, as Steve was talking about, and uh, I'm doing a lot of work these days in virtual reality. So it's uh, I think that when you're looking forward to sort of where you want to be as students or where you want your students to ultimately be, staying apprised of the current technology and creating opportunities to connect with that te technology. Even if it's just, you know, back when I was at UBC, people really wanted to do iPhone programming. So I'm like, okay, we started an iPhone club. I didn't really know how to do it at the time either, but we just learned together. So, you know, if students are, if you provide students opportunities to, to see what's out there in the real world, then the rest is just going to sort of happen. You're really just germinating these ideas. So, you know, get some, well, the Oculus Rift kind of sucks. Maybe wait for the new dev kit. But, you know, get some dev kits. Get some, you know, get some some uh, Unity licenses or at least the free licenses and create opportunities for people to get together and just make stuff together. And it's really going to go a long way to cement what it is that they're they're learning but at the same time provide this great path forward to uh, to future learning and future career possibilities too and it will help those students differentiate themselves from from others when they're applying for jobs too great uh, or so, so are you the one who started the uh, the, the revered uh, iPhone club at UBC oh is it revered <laughs> yeah um, it, Ed Nor wouldn't stop talking about it when I was, when I visited recently. Apparently, it's still very fondly remembered. Wow. Well, there you go. Uh, I, I yes, I guess so. If I mean, there could have been a competing one that was held in stealth that I wasn't aware of. But uh, yeah, uh, several years ago, I did start an iPhone club, and we met at one point. We had almost 120 people in the group. Although then exams hit, and it was like whew, down to 12. But. They, uh, I still have those students follow up with me and show me what they're working on, and a couple of them have published things to the App Store now, which is pretty cool. Sweet. Uh, okay, well, I guess, do you have any shout-outs, as they say, or is there anyone you want to thank, or you know, where can we find you on Twitter or whatever? Um, oh, gosh, there's, there's a million people to shout-out. Wow. Uh, I, I mean... Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna leave somebody out if I do that. So uh, maybe I'll just I'll I'll tread more carefully. But um, yeah, I mean I think that I I think that uh, I'd, I'd make a shout out to to where I work currently, the Center for Digital Media, and the awesome folks here. Uh, it's a it's a great master's program, and it's been an awesome opportunity to take the years that I did as a computer science educator and translate that into something far more 
applied uh, and be able to, to teach that. I mean, I've been making games and stuff for, for a really long time, but to actually be able to take that knowledge plus the knowledge of teaching computer science and combine that uh, in, in creative ways here has, has been awesome. And I definitely think that I've been able to do that well because of the awesome people here and, and, and my colleagues here. Uh, and then, of course, I would call out Steve, who's been one of my longtime close friends who helped keep me sane at, at UBC. So definitely a lot of what I learned from, from teaching uh, came very directly from the office next door, uh, whether Steve knew it or not, so I'm, I'm very grateful there. But yeah, if, if I haven't bored you to tears and you want to hear me yatter on about other things, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm Zany Tomato. I'll, here, I'll type it in the chat window as soon as I find my mouse cursor. There it goes. Uh, yeah, Zany Tomato. So you can follow me at Twitter there. I have a blog, which is just zanytomato.tumblr.com, and I... I ramble on about all sorts of things ranging from gender issues in computer science to education to video games to uh, virtual reality, I think, is the last blog article I just recently posted. So you can, uh, you can read more of my ramblings there if, you are, if you're interested. All right. Thank you very much for being our, uh, our first uh, guest in the CS Education Zoo, Kim. It was a good zoo. I hope I was a good enough animal. <laughs> It was great starting with the vole. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they look like. So I guess next week we're on, well, on July the 1st, we're on with Rob Simmons. That's right, That's right. July the 1st, and, uh, and I'll, I'll tweet about that. And we have a website now, which is webber.net slash zoo.html. <laughs> it's our current URL. Uh, so, yeah, that's where we'll keep the up. Uh, the upcoming shows, and also I'll, I'll link uh, videos to the, you know, the previous shows. So, so we have an official page. We might want to class your URL at some point. Uh, but uh, th also thank you, uh, not just the Kim, but also to, I guess, I don't know, there's got to be, is there like a menagerie uh, version of the peanut gall gallery, like the other animals who, who uh, joined us today? Uh, thank you to all, to, to everyone, and uh, um, I hope that this will be a tradition we can um, keep up and that we'll learn lots of cool things about teaching and computer science and education. And thank you very much, Kim. That was extremely interesting. Thank you, guys. That was fun. All right. And I will stop the broadcast now. If anyone wants to hang out afterwards, that's fine. We can chat. All right.